We're going to go. We're going to come f full circle and come back to Jamie and Swiss, who uh, uh, is, as you can tell, a remarkable magician. But more than that, uh, in fact, Jamie has been producer of of, uh, of a number of magic shows, the longest running off Broadway magic show in New York for 15 years, Monday Night Magic. But he's also been writing and lecturing about magic for a long time and about, in fact, the issue of deception. And in that regard, he's also been very active in the skeptic community. And he's now, in fact, uh, uh, a fellow of the James Randi Foundation. And um, he, he helps administer what many of you may have heard is the Million Dollar Prize, which has been offered to anyone who can demonstrate paranormal ability under mutually agreed upon text conditions. And of course, uh, no one's won that prize. Uh, and happen. I should, before he begins, I'll just say the New Yorker magazine d declared that he is widely thought of to have one of the most masterly sleight of hand techniques in the world today. And we'll see what his sleight of mouth technique is in a moment. <laughs> so, Jamie. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. Thanks. I'd like, to be, I'd like to begin by addressing, I'll be it very briefly, the first two questions that were on the agenda today. One, uh, why is deception such an integral part of the human condition? And two, what evolutionary purpose could it possibly serve? Um, so, I'll be it briefly. Do these pants make my ass look fat? That concludes the portion of my <laughs> addressing the first two questions on the agenda. Moving on. I'm a professional magician, and uh, I would like to talk to you today about how magicians deceive you. Now, all magicians know that magic, a successful magic illusion, occurs only in the minds of the spectator. As a magician friend and colleague of mine, Peter Samuelson, so elegantly puts it, I can't really do magic. I can only help you to see it. But to manipulate the mind of another person requires that one is able to imagine that mind. And in the worlds of philosophy and psychology, this is known as theory of mind. And theory of mind, in its most basic description, is the ability to attribute mental states to others, uh, beliefs, intents, desires, and more, uh, in order to better understand how those beliefs cause action in others. And a subset or related concept of theory of mind is the notion of empathy, which is the emotional component. It's the ability to share the feelings of others, the emotional aspect of theory of mind. Uh, now, I found a quote where uh, Robert Trivers has said that empathy is a very important part of deceit. And I agree. And I've just said that to empathize, one must construct a theory of mind, an awareness of the existence of minds outside our own. And humans can begin to do this at a surprisingly young age. What's interesting about this, partly to me as a magician, is that in order to try and establish or identify the, the development of theory of mind, we use uh, the ability to deceive. We investigate the ability to deceive because the ability to create deception as well as to understand the notion of false belief in others are requisites to a concept of mind. So while it was long believed that children did not master the technique of lying until the age of four or, or so, more recently behavioral studies indicate that infants can begin to exhibit deceptive behavior as early as six months. And one recent study revealed that, quote, infants quickly learn that using tactics such as fake crying and pretend laughing could win them attention. And that by eight months, more difficult deceptions became apparent, such as concealing forbidden activities or trying to distract parents' attention. Eight months! Or as a typically colorful headline from the UK's Globe and Mail put it, sneaky babies learn to lie before they learn to talk. <laughs> now, although magicians use deception, we do so in a context that is both authentic and indeed ethical. By invoking the word magic or conjuring, magicians establish a clear moral contract with the audience. Uh, in the words of a world-famous American magician at the turn of the 20th century, Carl Germain, he said that, Quote, conjuring is the only absolutely honest profession. The conjurer promises to deceive and does. See, if I didn't tell you first, I'd be in advertising or politics. Uh, and my website, by the way, is honestliar.com, so there. But while magicians use deception in service to, an, an art, to artistic goals, creating the experience of mystery for our audiences, in other contexts, deception can be used to take advantage, to turn audiences into victims. For example, in the world of the professional con man. 
Now I can tell you that the con artist takes his victim on a kind of controlled psychological tour when, for example, he suckers a mark, a victim, with three card Monty or shell game, street scams and so-called short cons that have been around for centuries but still continue to find a ready supply of fresh victims around the world every day. And you know, the word con in con game actually is short for confidence because it speaks to the requirement of the con man to gain the victim's confidence, yes? And eventually in knowing and controlling what the mark will think, what he will feel, and ultimately what he will do. So to create a perfect, an effective performance, the con artist and the magician alike must engage the audience's emotions. And not just for their intellect, not just their intellect, or else magic is reduced to a mere puzzle, not an experience of mystery, an intellectual experience instead of an emotional and aesthetic one. And so whether for good or for ill, empathy is a necessity. Now, I'm going to use a coin for a moment here to demonstrate, uh, just give you a brief glimpse uh, into how hard we work to try and fool you because we don't get to use lying as a method. We're honest liars and we've told you that we're lying and that changes a lot of things. So here's something that your grandfather did terribly but can be done beautifully. <sighs> to make a coin disappear, it's what you saw Apollo Robbins do before. It's called the French drop. It's a basic uh, technique of sleight of hand, one of the first things we learned to make a coin or a ob small object disappear. Um, and uh, there's a lot of st steps involved in this. Uh, because it's a very unnatural way of doing this. Now, when your grandfather did this, he probably, you know, pointed at the other hand like this and clenched his hand, and, you know, in some desperate attempt to fool you, and, and it probably worked because you were five. <laughs> but when I teach this technique to my adult students, I actually begin with the position of the feet. Because this is what magicians call a false transfer. We're be pretending to transfer the coin from one hand to the other. It's a very unnatural event. It's not something that actually occurs in real life very often. Uh, and so in order to try and convince you of that, we have to try and transfer everything else but the coin to try and convince you. So we begin by transferring weight. I begin with the weight here, with that knee locked. And then as I do the slight, I'm going to transfer the weight from one to the other. You don't see that consciously, but you will register it. Uh, I transfer tension. There's tension in this hand. The wrist is locked. This hand is relaxed and apparently empty. And as I appear to transfer the coin, I've now transferred the tension. I've added it to this hand, subtracted it from this hand, which is apparently relaxed and empty now. And I've transferred my focus with my eyes and my head, focusing on the coin here and then on the coin here. I'm transferring everything but the coin. And to give you even a further little window into this, um, you might think that if I was going to make a coin disappear, I might rely on something called palming, right? Whatever that is. Um, well, even that's, that's uh, mis misleading. It's a misleading term because it doesn't really have anything to do with the palm. Uh, palming is a jargon term for magicians that means a concealment. And we have many, many concealments in the hand. Uh, so there might be high finger palm, low finger palm, thumb palm, uh, front finger, finger grip, uh, back palm, first finger grip, fourth finger grip, deep center back clip. And sometimes in order to make that coin disappear, it might just amount to balancing the coin on the back of the hand. I mean, who? So, thank you. So, but you see, the method, many people think that the thing that separates magicians from the rest of you is that we know the method, but this is silly. The method, the mechanical method of the French drop is this. That's it. You lift the thumb, the coin falls down. That's the method. But by itself, this does nothing without the mis what magicians call misdirection, which relates to all of the psychology and the naturalness and the movement and the timing and all of this stuff that goes together to create a deception. And when you put it all together, it can look like that. But the important thing is, never point. Thank you. Now, it's been said that sleight of hand, like I just showed you there, is lying with the hands. And uh, <clears throat> you remember at the start when I said that I was done addressing the subject of the so social and psychological benefits of deception? I lied. <laughs> because in considering the cost of deception, one must ask, how is it that we are all so readily deceived? Indeed, for anyone who wants to try to protect themselves and others from being deceived, whether by con men or phony psychics or professional casino cheats, all subjects of professional and personal interest to me, the single most important lesson I have today to offer you is this. Everyone can 
be fooled. Anyone can be fooled. And blaming the victim's stupidity is often a seriously mistaken and inappropriate explanation. Rather, one must often credit the con man. Like the magician, the con man has developed and refined his principles of deceptions over centuries, taking advantage of his practical expertise in human psychology, the same kind of practical expertise that Susanna and Stephen are trying to tease out and study in a scientific manner today. But what is it in our psychological makeup that renders us all so deceivable? The answer, in short, is trust. Human beings have evolved to be trusting beings. Now, I want to point out there's a conventional trope about people supposedly wanting to be deceived. Well, I think this is nonsense. Rather, there are aspects of the way our brain has evolved that can, as a side effect, lead us to be deceived. Safely by magicians, dangerously by advertisers and politicians, all but fatally by con men and sociopaths. But that is that in, or in order to be a social animal, you have to be able to trust others. It makes sense to want to believe people. We have evolved to disbelieve the notion that people can look us in the eye and lie. Very hard for us to process that. Because the alternative, an ever vigilant extreme of caution and protectiveness, is contrary to being an effective social animal. A human animal that is constantly wary, relentlessly on guard, quick to protect itself against any risk of deception, would be a very untrusting being. And that's not a being that will find it easy to develop constructive relationships and function well socially with his peers and colleagues, family and society. To do these things, we must be willing to trust. And indeed, to trust is in our very nature, and despite the associated risks. Now, the main protections we have against deceivers is our built-in in-group, out-group programming, which kicks in at a very early age in mammals, as soon as we've learned to recognize immediate family and friends. But that's a generalized kind of hope for the best protection that evolution has given us. It doesn't account for individuals who are willing to operate maliciously within the group. It doesn't protect you from Bernie Madoff, who ruthlessly relied upon in-group status to manipulate his victims. And as Carol recently pointed out to me, our psychology is pre-wired to protect us from the times when we will inevitably be fooled which typically produces dissonance. How could I have been so stupid? And which we immediately strive to reduce. Uh, I wasn't stupid. Let me mortgage my house and give the guy another 100 grand, which people actually did with Madoff. So I confess, I think it's foolish to talk about people's desire to be deceived. Just as any of us can be fooled, all of us engage in self-deception as well. But ultimately, it's for a higher purpose, for the benefits it delivers us in dealing with ourselves, other people, and the inherent dissonance of this world. Nobody wants to be fooled, except at the magic show, where being fooled is not the same as being a fool. But fooled we all shall be. And it cannot happen without empathy or without trust. And the ability to trust, even when the cost means being occasionally victimized, is central and essential in human life and society. So sure, try not to be fooled, but don't be too hard on yourself when it happens. Thanks. So, I'd like to uh, leave you with a, a vivid demonstration of the role that empathy plays in magic. You know, from the very start in magic, magicians use empathy. Uh, most people get involved in magic at the age of seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, and uh, by the age of eight, I had practice mirrors on my table, right, that I practiced in. And those mirrors represented the eyes and minds that I was trying to fool. They were windows into an alien consciousness, which I was trying to create an illusion for that I could not experience myself. So I'm going to give you sort of a crack at that. I'm going to offer you an, a unique piece of magic in which all of you will be able to see the workings uh, and exercise your own empathic abilities. And I believe that the more empathy that you have, the more you will enjoy the result. Now, I asked, I approached someone earlier, I didn't make any prearrangements other than to simply ask, if it's Kim, right? Is that right? If you were willing to help me, are you willing to give me a help? But would you uh, come up and it's Kim, would you give her a warm welcome? Thank you for so much for, for joining me, and uh, let's go this way. And although I did ask you quickly, uh, briefly before, if you were willing to help, other than that, you have no idea what's going on. We haven't prearranged anything or anything like that. Now, you and I are going to collaborate here and create, demonstrate a unique kind of magic, the kind of magic that I can accomplish when I deprive you of one of your senses. Now, it will not be your sense of humor. We need that. 
and uh, there will be no permanent damage, I promise, okay? And it's not my intention to embarrass you in any way at all. I really think you're going to have a unique experience uh, and a memorable and magical one, okay? So the sense I'm going to deprive you of, Kim, is your sense of sight. And I don't want to uh, blindfold you because from time to time I need you to open your eyes and you'll see what's going on, yes? So, uh, if, but, but when I do ask you to keep your eyes closed, I'll ask you to really kind of concentrate on that. If you open your eyes sort of accidentally or blink or something, you'll just see it at the wrong time and you'll, you'll lose the sense of the illusion. Fair enough? So I thought we'd begin with a little test. Close your eyes, please. Dark in there, isn't it? It, uh, it actually makes a lot of this magic stuff a little easier from what I've heard. <laughs> I'm going to come back to you right here now. Okay. And open your eyes. And has anything changed? Yes, and that is? I have a hanger around. Good, that's good, that's good, because if you didn't notice, it means I'm doing magic for the visually impaired. No one's impressed. Um, I actually grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, we used to call this a car antenna. Now, um, I've dated myself. Could you come just a little closer to me? Thank you very much. That's good. And now, if you would be so kind as to extend your hand straight out to me like this, almost together, just like that, and I'm just going to, just a little bit lower, I'm just going to run my hands down your arms. Obviously, you can feel that. You can see that. You know exactly where my hands are. And I'm going to do that one more time in a moment. I'd like you to close your eyes now. This is no longer a test. And keep them closed until I explicitly ask you to open your eyes. I'll count off later and ask you to open them. Once again, one more time, I'll rub my hands down your arms. And as a matter of fact, just to make us a little more secure, would you turn your hands up and grasp me by the wrists, please, firmly from beneath. Hold tight. A little blood must flow. Uh, but the, now don't let go, but do give me a little flex. Keep your hands closed, but do give me a little room to flex so I can reach up, take the hanger from over my head, and I will tap you with that. You can feel that. Yes? Okay. And so now, <clears throat> um, in a moment, I will count to three. And at that moment, on the count of three, and only on the count of three, you can open your eyes as you and the entire audience will see the solid hanger pass through your arm. Ready? <laughs> One, two, three. That's a little strange, huh? Yes, it is. OK. <laughs> all right, all right. It's supposed to be. Uh, now, with that, can you figure out any way to get that off without letting go of me? That would be the magic part. So you can let go now. You can let go and take a look while you have it, while you have it. Make sure it's solid, right? It doesn't come apart. There's no breaks, no gaps, no holes. A little hole in there, but that doesn't count. And um, here's the idea. The first time there, you had control over my hands. Always a good idea. Um, the second time, we'll start by giving you control over the hanger. So reach out with your right hand and just grasp the hanger just like that. That's perfect. And now I'll ask you to close your eyes again. All right? Keep them closed until I ask you to open them. And while you have a grip on that, you have a grip on the hanger, right? Reach out with your left hand and just wrap it over your other, uh, around your other hand. That's good. And now in a moment, I'm going to ask you to release the hanger to me, but only open enough, enough to let the hanger out and then immediately reclasp your hand so that the circle of your arm remains un arms remains unbroken. Yes? So just leave, release the hanger to me. Right now. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Wow, you weren't taking any chances. That's good. That's good. Okay. So you can feel the hanger outside there. Okay. Now, once again, I'm going to count to three. And on the count of three, and only then, you can open your eyes as you and the entire audience will see the solid hanger pass through your arm. Here we go. One, two, three. Did you all see it pass through her arm? A little stranger than the first one, yes? OK, so now let's see what we can do. I'll tell you what, face front, if you would. And this time, I'll give you control. The first time you had control over my hands, the second time you had control over the hanger, this time I'm going to give you control over the closed circle that we're going to try and pass the hanger onto. So if you would be so kind as to put your right hand on top of your head, just like this. Jelly bean, or jelly. I've dated myself. Uh, OK, and now uh, face front. And close your eyes, all right? Keep them closed until I ask you. Now, it's funny, can people in your situation, they often come up to me after the show, and they say, you know, I don't know exactly how you did that, Jamie, but I think you cheated. And it's true, I do cheat, but honest, only a little. And so here's the, now, now, is there any way you can think of I could possibly get this solid hanger into the circle of your arm right now? Any way you could think of me doing that? Well, I could chop off your head or cut off your arm, but <laughs> I did promise there would be no permanent damage. So those are excluded from the uh, protocol. So now, 
Once again, I'm going to, you can feel the hanger outside. I'm going to uh, count to three. And on the number three, you can open your eyes as you and everyone else sees the solid hanger pass through your arm. <laughs> One, two, three. Oh, baby. <laughs> yeah, right? Keep your hand up there. Keep your hand up there. Okay. See that? Okay. Now, just for the record, okay, now face front, because I don't want to hurt you. If I hurt you, I'll marry you. Uh, okay, now the truth of the matter is, we did not prearrange any of this. And you're not just going along with this for the ride. You actually don't know how it works, right? I mean, it's like it's over your head. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There'll be an apology in the Times in the morning. Okay. Um, so here we go. One last time. One last time. Uh, close your eyes. Face front. Keep your hand up there. Keep your eyes closed. Extend your left hand, all arm, all the way out to the left, if you would. Matter of fact, put your left hand on your hip. Okay, and uh, you can feel the hanger here in your arm, okay? And now I'm going to tap you three times very slowly, and on the count of three, you're going to open your eyes and witness the miracle. One, two, two and a half, and three. <laughs> and that's amazing, and that's empathy. Thank you, darling. You're great. I told you it'd be fun, right? Hey, it's Kim. Give her a nice hand. So magicians uh, fall in love with magic, as I said, about the age of seven and ten, and then we spend our lives trying to create illusions for the experience of illusion for others, the experience of mystery for others, and the better we get at creating that, the less we're able to experience ourselves, until we get to the point where most of the time we're only experiencing magic vicariously through the eyes and the mind of our audience. And so <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed, I hope you all enjoyed having the opportunity to see how that worked. But, as, but even if you had a good experience doing that, and I hope you did, I think Kim had an even better experience. She had a, a unique experience of mystery. And with knowledge comes a burden, yes? And a small burden is, although not insignificant, is the burden of helping to preserve Kim's sense of mystery tonight. <laughs> because there is no honor or heroism in ripping it away from her. So. I would, not, I would not be in a hurry to do that. But more significantly, <clears throat> there is this, is that she, the fact that she had a unique experience that now, with the burden of knowledge, now and forever, will always be denied to the rest of you. So the next time you think you want to know how a magic trick is done, just remember, that opportunity is now denied you. And hey, you know, I'm truly sorry about that, but hell, I empathize. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's intermission. We'll see you for the Q&A.